All right, so、um, without further ado, SQL, structured query language. So you've probably used this at least in CS50, maybe in CS165, maybe in your own personal projects. And what does SQL let you do in a SQL server more generally? Yeah. Okay, that was a very circuitous way of saying it.、Um, yes, so it allows you to store data and more importantly, allows you to query for data. And this is a step forward from using something simpler like a CSV, right? Comma separated variables, similar、uh, values, similarly let you save information, one row in a text file. But what's the downside of a CSV file for storing your data, even though you effectively get rows and columns from it? Yeah. You don't have the same organization efficiency. What do you mean? Well, like if the, you can have like primary、um, keys or IDs. Okay,、um, yeah. Essentially, it's a relational database, so you can have multiple databases linked to each other in very specific ways. Okay,、so、good. And let me tweak a little terminology. So, multiple tables within the database, sure. And that goes beyond what you can do with just one CSV. But really, the limitation with CSV, I would argue, is that the inefficiency of it all. It's very easy to lay out. But if you want to do a query, what's the running time of any select query on a CSV file? I mean, it's big O of N, right? Because in the worst case, the row's at the very bottom. Even if you have sorted the whole CSV file, if you don't know that up front, well, you're still going to have to search the whole thing. So, among the things we're going to get from using an actual database using a language like SQL is we can query it. And we can, in advance, as database designers, specify what are the fields that we're likely going to have questions about so that people at MySQL or Microsoft or Oracle, whoever's made the database you're using, can do all of the hard work of figuring out, OK, a y given a million of these IDs, how can we Lay out them out in memory, some kind of tree structure perhaps, so that when you do actually execute select, it's something that's logarithmic or logarithmic of logarithmic in time rather than actually devolving into something linear. So we get a lot of performance that way, and we can also store a lot more data. More readily, because a SQL server is typically stored in RAM, even though parts of it might be stored on disk. And you probably know by now that RAM is generally faster than disk, so that's a good thing. And we can also handle concurrency much better. If you've taken 165 or 161, you know that if two people try to do the same thing at once on a system, bad things can generally happen. So, among the other features we can get if we design our tables in the right way, is better support and security when it comes to concurrency. So, two people in two parts of the world using the same website. If they both try to buy something at the same time, that order is not going to go in simultaneously. Somehow they will be serialized by someone other than our own,、uh, than, um, someone other than ourselves. The database will do that for us. So, in its simplest form, SQL lets us query a relational database. A relational database is one that has one or more tables in it typically. And if this is a little unfamiliar, you can really just think of this as Excel or Numbers or Google Spreadsheets. It just has rows and columns. And typically, the top of each of those rows has a name for it. So this might be the ID column, the name column, the address column, and so forth. And then you can have multiple such tables if you want to start laying out. Different types of data. But you may recall, at least from CS50, that we tried to give you a GUI based tool with which you to manage your database. It was called PHP MyAdmin, sort of just a coincidence that it was written in PHP. It really was just a web based front end to a database. And via the various tabs and links, could you begin to configure a database for yourself? But a good tool to start to get a little more comfortable with is also the command line client. So if using the CS50 appliance or really using any Mac or PC that has a command line MySQL client, you can also do It's sort of old school like this. As an aside,、um, the MySQL project, at least the open source version of it, is now called MariaDB for various reasons. You can read up on Wikipedia, but it's the same software, it's the same syntax, and so forth, pretty much the same code base. And so when I'm at this prompt, I can now interact with my database much more manually. So, case in point, let me go ahead and just open up a terminal window. I happen to be using the CS50 appliance, but you can do this on most any system in which you've got the right software installed. And I'm going to do MySQL. Uh, dash U for username John Harvard on this particular system, dash P for a password that I'll type in a little more securely by hitting enter. Now I'm prompted. I'm going to type crimson in the CS50 appliance, and now I see essentially that same screen. But there's commands now that we can start typing, like show. Databases, and that's going to show me all of the databases that I have already created in this system. Pretty much the same list you would see in PHP MyAdmin. There's a couple of others like Information Schema and Test, which, if you poke around the CS50 appliance, we hide some of these lower level tables, but they've been there all this time. MySQL actually has low level properties like usernames and passwords for the database itself. 
not for your application that you might be running on top of it. So in advance today, I created a couple databases, one of which is called Courses 50.、Um, odds are some of you, ha- you have used CS50's course shopping tool, which is a big、um, interface for the registrar's course catalog. And this is actually a nice data set to talk about because, one, we're sort of all obviously familiar with courses and instructors and meeting locations and all the sort of ordinary things of a university. But it's also got some interesting opportunities for design. So we thought we'd use the notion of a course catalog and a shopping tool. As an example throughout today to sort of frame some of the design decisions we have to make. So let's start there. Suppose that I actually wanted to、um, represent the super simplest of course shopping tools. And the simplest world I can imagine in one is in which there are courses and there are instructors. And let's suppose, for the sake of discussion, that every course has at least a name. So let's begin to sketch this out. I'm going to use PHP MyAdmin just as a convenience so we don't have to type out all of the queries manually. But here I am in my Courses 50 database.、Um, if unfamiliar with this, it'll be very easy once you dive into your own project if you'd like to use it. I'm going to create a table called Courses. And I can only think of one field for now, the name of a course. So I'm going to go ahead and say, Give me one column. Now, if you recall, you get an interface that's a bit like this. And the other upside, frankly, of PHP MyAdmin is that it's sort of self instructing, and that via the drop downs, you can sort of see what your possible design decisions are. So I'm going to give every course a name. That's the name of this column. And how about its data type? Most of you should know at least some of these data types from prior experience. What's appropriate for a course name, Sharon? OK, varchar, which is variable char. And what does that mean more technically? OK, so it's a string, and the var aspect of it implies what? Variable, but what does that mean? Yeah? Exactly. So it's a variable number of characters in this string up to some maximum. So here's our first design decision. We actually have to decide how many bytes maximally to allocate to each such string.、Um, generally speaking, you want to sort of not make it too small, not make it too big, because obviously if it's too small, you're just going to start truncating data and you'll lose、uh, information. And if it's too big, you're just sort of telling the database to expect and to optimize for more data than it might actually ever get. So, what's a reasonable feeling number for the name? Of a course? 60? OK, so 60.、Um, that seems pretty reasonable so long as there's no exceptions to that.、Um, there's really no hard, fast rule. To be honest, for historical reasons, a lot of people will choose 255 because for years that was sort of the default maximum. Um, using 8 bytes,、uh, 8 bits as your counter.、Um, I more anally might use powers of 2, but it's sort of irrelevant. So we can go with 60. That seems reasonable so long as we eventually don't regret it, because that is an upper bound. Now, suppose the opposite decision had been made not variable chars, but just a char field. So unlike C and C, char doesn't mean one char. In databases, it generally means a fixed number of characters in a string. What would be the upside andor downside of my choosing 60 for a char field? Instead of our char. This is exactly the first kind of decision you'll have to make when specking out a project with your partners. Yeah, Sharon again. Good. So if the name's fewer than 60, then you're wasting whatever that delta is between 60 and the actual length. So that just feels wasteful, more bytes than you need. But why does it exist? Surely there's some upside. Yeah. Sure. So sometimes you might know the fixed number of characters, like 10 digits for a phone number, for instance. But who cares? Like, why not just say 11 anyway? Or why not say 60 anyway with a varchar? What advantage do we get by knowing and designing for a fixed number of characters? You're on the right track. So it's optimization, but it's really of. OK, a y good. Let's, pluck, let's focus on that last part. So, indexing. So, it turns out if you know in advance that all of your fields are going to be 60 characters, you can really think of this column in the Excel database as having very straight left justified and right justified edges because every column is 60 characters wide. That means that this string is 60 characters away from this string, 60 characters away from this one, and this one, and this one. So, just like back when you learned C, you had random access in the world of arrays, same idea here. If your column is represented, 
implemented using only fixed length chars, you can effectively index randomly to 60 or 120 or 180, and you can get at individual strings much more quickly than if instead your column had a straight left edge, so to speak, but a very ragged right edge to the column because you might have 10 characters, 15 characters, 5 characters. So this too is a trade-off. And sometimes only through trial and error and experimentation can you figure out what really the right call is. But these are the kinds of questions that should be going through your minds and or tables when it comes time to design your database. So not necessarily a right answer, but you should at least have some sentence or two in mind to back up whatever decision you make. All right, so let's keep scrolling in the prompts here that are uh, PHP My Admins UI. So the default value for a name, should I specify that it should have a default value of null? What do you think? Can a course have a null name? Just feels weird, right? I can't think of any unnamed courses at Harvard. And maybe there's some obscure corner case where a course is given a number and the professor hasn't chosen a name for it. But I mean, to heck with that. Like, let's not even bother supporting that. I would say in the interest of a nice, clean database, let's specify that you cannot have a default value of null. Alternatively, we could do something like untitled course, which is not unlike what Mac OS and Windows do when you create a folder, for instance. But there, that makes a little more sense so that the human sees something. We're talking about a back-end database, presumably, for a course catalog. So I don't really even like the idea of giving it an untitled course name, since that's not really going to help anyone. So let's leave this as none, which means that when you insert into this database, you have to give every course a name, which feels a little cleaner to me. All right, so scrolling further, collation. This just has to do with character sets and whatnot. If you've ever seen mentions of Swedish in PHP MyAdmin, that's because the people who wrote PHP MyAdmin um, were uh, Swedish. Is that PHP not? Or is it MySQL? One of the two. I forget offhand. But it's for historical reasons. But you can express every character in English that you could with Swedish. So it's largely a non-issue. The CS50 appliance, though, is used, configured to use UTF-8. So that generally should not pop up for you. Attributes. So none of these are really relevant here. I see binary, unsigned, unsigned zero fill, and on update current timestamp. That field only applies for some numeric fields or some time fields. So we'll skip over that entirely. Um, null. Can this field be null? So no. We already had that sort of conversation. So we don't want a default value. We don't want it to be null. What about index? There's four choices here. What does it mean if we specify that this row is going to be a primary key? Thinking back to CS50 or CS165, if you've taken it. Exactly. So a primary key, by definition, is the field that uniquely identifies each row in this table. And you can rely on it to do that unique identification. So what does it mean, then, to just be unique? Well, sort of this, too, has sort of um, under implications underneath the hood. But generally, primary key is sort of a, a contract you make with the database saying that when I do queries looking for a course, I'm going to use this particular field. And we'll come back to why we might have two such choices here, primary or unique. Unique just says, this field is going to be unique, but I'm not really making any kind of verbal commitment here to use that field to do my searches, for reasons we'll see in just a moment. Um, if we specify instead index, what does it mean to specify that a field has an index on it? Yeah. Exactly. It's been optimized for queries. So you, it, the database server, Oracle, MySQL, whatever, will generally work its magic behind the scenes once you click that option and then click Save. And it will build up typically a tree structure, B trees, if you've seen or heard of. It's just a very uh, short looking tree that gives you very nice logarithmic properties when searching on the data. If you don't specify an index on a field, what's going to be the running time of searching for an arbitrary course name? What's that? O of n, linear, right? If there's no optimizations afforded to the database and you haven't taught the database what kind of data to expect, the best it can do is check everything when you're looking for some value, especially if there could, in fact, be duplicates. Full text, meanwhile, we'll wave our hands at for now. But generally, this is a type of index that allows you to optimize for keyword searches on a field. So this might be a good candidate for like a course description where you might have a couple of paragraphs and you might want to do substring matches. Full text will generally let you do that fairly efficiently. Um, AI, this is a horrible sort of um, 
explanation, but if we hover over it, you'll see auto increment. Not applicable here, but auto increment is useful for like an int field because the database will take care of the process of plus plusing it every time you do an insert. So that even if two people literally click submit at the same time and try to create a row somehow in the database, one of them will get the number i, the other will get the number i plus one. You don't have to worry about two numbers being assigned identically if you were to do this yourself in code. All right, so I kind of like where we've gotten name to be. So let's click Save. Is this a good design for a database table? And as an aside, if Rusty on SQL or you sort of just always turned a blind eye to what was going on, I could have typed exactly that, those three lines at that black and white prompt in the command line client, or I could have done that in code programmatically. So all PHP MyAdmin is doing for me is just saving me the effort of remembering sometimes the syntax and typing out fairly tedious commands. All right. So this doesn't feel like the best design, a one field table. Now we could have things like professors and locations and descriptions, but even then, using name only to identify courses doesn't feel ideal. What generally have we done in the past, if you've used databases, to uniquely identify rows? Not using varchars typically, yeah. Yeah, so typically a course ID. So the most common approach here, especially when using a framework, is actually just to use a number, like an integer. So let me go ahead and do this. And we can do this in a few ways, but notice if I zoom in on the bottom here, I'm going to say add one columns at the end of the table. Generally, just for visual convenience, you put IDs at the beginning of the table, even though this has no real functional impact. So I'm going to say add one columns at the beginning of the table. I'm going to click go. That gives me back this uh, UI here. Let's call this ID. Um, if we think we're going to have no more than uh, 4 million courses, an int feels fine. We could even shrink it down, but space is cheap, so who really cares? But if we were trying to write Facebook now, it might not be a bad thing to anticipate big ints, which would give us 64-bit ints, but then you're literally doubling the number of bits that you're using. So minor trade-off, but something to consider. Now this is... Um, a confusing uh, legacy thing. You might recall from using MySQL that anytime you declare an int field, you'll often see a number next to it, like the number 10. That has nothing to do with the size of the number or the number of bits. That has to do with the number of characters that are used to visually display that int field when using a terminal window. So we can see that in a moment. So don't be misled by typing numbers in there, even though it's effectively asking us for one here. Over here, I'm going to go ahead and say unsigned. There's no reason to waste all of our negative numbers, since the database is generally going to assume positive values. Or uh, null, the ID definitely shouldn't be null. And what do you think about the index for this ID field? Yeah, let's make it primary. So what if, though, like I can only think of one CS-164 course at Harvard and only one CS-50 course at Harvard, and that's pretty much true overall, though there's maybe exceptions if ECT-10 is both semesters or something weird like that. But more fundamentally, why is it better to use a numeric integral ID to uniquely identify courses rather than just a unique string? Okay, interesting. So if we had sort of cross-listed courses. So that's a good example. I'm not sure I would solve that, though, by giving them the same ID number, if that's where you were going with that. No? Okay, but definitely a corner case to consider if there's sort of, we need some kind of aliasing potentially. Sure. That's a good example. The name might change over time. Totally reasonable. What else? Insert fastest comparison. Sorry, say again? Insert fastest comparison. Yeah, exactly. So really, that's the real clincher, is that using a 32-bit int is probably going to be faster than some variable length char field. In the first case, the thing can literally fit in a register, not to mention it's much smaller memory footprint. Um, in the latter case, you're going to have to do, resort to string comparisons, which in themselves would be linear in the size of the string, potentially. So it's just a nice optimization. And in particular, it's going to let us do what are called joins more efficiently in just a moment. So let's do that. We'll specify that this is primary. Uh, because I don't particularly want to care or think about what the number is of a course. Let them take on whatever values they want. I'm going to say auto increment so I can outsource that detail. As an aside, you might know that uh, Harvard, at least, 
does have unique numbers for courses. I have no recollection what this course is. I know that CS50's catalog number is 4949, completely arbitrary. Um, but there's weird corner cases in that even in um, the registrarial dump of course catalog data, um, sometimes courses, old courses, have a number like four. But technically, that field is a char field that simply starts with 0, 0, 0, 4. So here, too, you have to be careful about distinguishing between things like a course catalog number, which might have some human notion of fixed length, 0, 0, 0, 4, and you should not store that, for instance, in an int. That kind of field should be stored elsewhere. So in Harvard, if we were actually making a sh course shopping tool, it's probably not sufficient to number courses with just 1, 2, 3, 4. We're probably going to have to have another field called catalog number that is also supposed to be unique based on human conventions here, but it's not the best choice for a unique identifier because it might be variable length. It might not be four chars. It might be five. In fact, I think a few years ago they moved to five characters because there were more than um, 999 courses in total or something like that, um, or 9,999 courses. So that might be an example where the field is not primary, but it should be unique. An email address is another one. You might want it to be unique, but not necessarily your primary key. All right, so let me bang out another table much faster than this one. So I'm going to call this one instructors. And I'm going to give this a total number of columns of two. I'm going to learn my lesson from last time. I'm going to call the first column ID. I'm going to call the second column name. I'm also going to do varchar. I'm going to assume no professor has a name longer than 60 characters, though now this might be pushing it with some long names, especially people with middle names. That's fine for today. Uh, so let's scroll over here. Let's make this unsigned again. Let's make this primary. And we'll allow duplicate names in case there's two John Smiths or something like that. And now we have two tables. So now this begs the question, how do I associate an instructor with a course? I feel like I kind of got ahead of myself because if an instructor teaches a course, my first instinct would actually be to go back to courses, realize, hmm, this was not a good idea. Let me actually add one column at the end of the table, click go, and I'll call this instructor. And I'll make this varchar and I'll make this 60. Um, and maybe I'll leave it null now in case the course hasn't been assigned an instructor, which sometimes happens before term starts, and click Save. Which of these designs do you prefer? The first one, where we have a separate instructor's table, or the second, where we just add a field to the course so as to closely link instructor with course? Um, I would prefer the first design where we have a separate table just for the instructor. You can like, create a relationship in the table where like, OK, good, but let me push back. It's just so simple. Like, I can just type in the person's name into this table. Like, surely that has some value, or? All right, well, let me be difficult here. So let me say that this course is CS51. And I know it's taught this year by two people, so Henry Leitner and Jesse Tobe. But so I'll just put a comma between the two, right? I'm really good at CSV from yesteryear. Exactly, right? Like as soon as you resort to something like this, which might feel reasonable, and you might feel like this is kind of smart, I'm sort of borrowing one idea which used to work well, borrow a new idea and sort of combine them, you're kind of totally defeating the point of using the database in the first place. Because if one of the values of using it is faster searches because of the various indexes and tables that can be built up for you by the database engine itself, now if you want to search for all the courses that Jesse teaches, now you have to do substring matching on all of the instructor fields, which effectively means linear search again, because you have to find this arbitrary set of three characters anywhere in the instructor field preceded with and maybe followed by a comma. So this definitely doesn't bode well. So let me go back to the table. Let me go ahead to courses, undo that. I'm going to just go ahead and drop that field. And if you wanted to do this manually, the syntax is alter table uh, courses drop instructor. So let's go ahead and say yes to that. And go back to this earlier idea where I have a separate table for instructors. But now this feels a little. Uh, like I can put a course in the courses table, an instructor in the instructors table, but I somehow need to link the two. And how would you propose we do that? Good. 
So let's do that. And you could call this table in theory anything. I'm going to deliberately call it what a lot of frameworks would call it, among them Laravel, as you'll see in a bit. I'm going to call it course underscore instructor,、um, using singular in this case for each of the words and all lowercase again, and also with the Uh, them alphabetically sorted from left to right. This is totally arbitrary, but it tends to be a convention in a lot of these frameworks in PHP and other languages. How many columns do I need in this, what we'll call a join table, to join two other tables together? Three columns? Which one? What would they be? OK, good. That one works.、Um, and we could technically cut a corner here, but a lot of frameworks in particular would still give even these rows unique IDs, even though semantically the row that we really care about or the columns that we really care about are the latter two of what you said the course ID and the instructor ID. So let's do this. I'll call this row just ID, just like we did before. But this one I'm going to call course ID. This one I'm going to call instructor ID. And I'm going to specify that all of them are unsigned because I want to maximize my 4 billion int range. None of them should be null. I'm going to specify that ID should still be primary. And again, this is just a convention. A lot of frameworks, even if you don't sort of fundamentally need a unique identifier for the row, it turns out it's convenient for the code, the SQL that's going to be automatically generated for us. So I'll leave that as primary. But now I kind of have a design decision course ID and instructor ID. What indexes, if any, should they get? If I leave no indexes, what's the implication? What's an, a, a, an implication? Performance, as before, right? If there's no index, the best you can do is kind of troll through the whole thing looking for numbers. So that doesn't feel smart. Should it be primary? So why not? Why not primary? Perfect. So we rule out primary. We already chose that. So, should it be unique? If you assume one instructor per course. Good. So, if you assume one instructor per course, totally fine. And that's definitely the common case, but we already plucked off one perhaps familiar example. CS51's got two instructors, so we're kind of now. Screwed in that case. If we did allow only one instructor, we could actually do away with the join table altogether, go back to the earlier approach, and put not the person's name, perhaps, but the instructor's ID. If you know every course has just one instructor, you could have just one column. But the variability is what got us into trouble. All right, so should it be unique? No. Full text doesn't feel applicable. If we said before that's for like substring matching for descriptions. So, what about index? Well, index is probably our best candidate, which tells MySQL optimize for searches on this, or let me elaborate, optimize for searches or joins, as we'll see in just a moment, so that they're a little more efficient than anything purely linear. Do I want to auto increment this field? So, no, because the true parent element exists in the courses table. That's where it's going to get plus plus when it's actually inserted. Here, this is all going to be manually inserted by us, presumably, in code. So let's simply specify that both course ID and instructor ID have indexes. Now we'll go ahead and save. And now, just to show you the correspondence between what's a nice GUI friendly interface and the command line interface, let me go ahead and do the following at this MySQL prompt. I'm going to say、uh, use courses 50, which is the arbitrary name I gave to this database. And now I don't even remember what we did, so let me type show tables. And generally, semicolons will be your friend here to finish the query. And there it is. So, here are the rows, or the, rather the tables that we have here. Now, I forget what a course looks like, so let me do describe courses. And now I see sort of an ASCII art version of what phpMyAdmin was doing. And I see that ID is an int. There's that 10. What does that mean? That just means that when it's displayed, it's going to take up 10 characters on a terminal window.、Um, is it nullable? No. This is the primary key. Can it have a default value? Null.、Um, and extra, which is special flags like. Auto increment. So let's just do a couple of quick insertions here. I'm going to go up to,、uh, let's actually let's change state to a slide where I've sort of pre,、uh, pre prepared this. This is a summary then of all three of those tables. I already just manually typed the first command, and here I went ahead and typed the others for you. This is just a stylistic thing. Generally, a lot of people type SQL、uh, statements in all caps. 
and then table names and field names in lowercase, if only because then it kind of stands out what's your terminology and what's the database syntax. So here we have three tables courses, instructors, and courses, instructors. In the slide I made in advance, I didn't have the ID field, but that's not actually a bad thing at all. We would just see a third column there had I done that here. So now let me propose that we do a bunch of insertions. So here's some data. I'll zoom in. So I'm going to propose that in courses, we only deal with three courses. And I chose these three because they're representative of some nice, they have some nice properties. CS1, CS50, CS51. They have increasing IDs, but what ID is what is totally irrelevant. That's just the order in which they were auto uh, uh, inserted by me. How about instructors? So now, because Henry Leitner teaches both CS1 and CS51, this is kind of an opportune uh, implication for our design. And Jesse teaches CS51, and Malin teaches CS50. So now, or rather, these are just those people's unique IDs. In courses instructors, course instructors, notice here, course ID 1, which was CS1, is taught by instructor ID 1, who is Henry. Course ID 2, which I think was CS50, is taught by instructor ID 2, which is Malin. And then lastly, CS51, and notice we have two rows. And now this is why the join table is powerful, is taught by both Henry and Jesse. So this is all fine and good, but I can barely remember off the top of my head who is who here. How can you possibly deal with that in code without having to hard code things? Well, this is where SQL itself starts to become our friend. And I'm going to propose that we can type the following. I'll do this at an actual prompt. Let me go ahead and insert these things. So uh, into the courses table, let's do exactly what we had a moment ago. I'm going to go ahead and say, Let's insert CS1 and CS50. Let's insert a few more rows at once. CS51. Now let me go ahead and save. All right, so I'm just recreating as quickly as I can the relationships we just saw on the screen. So here we have Leitner. Here we have Malin. Let's give ourselves another row and Tove. Now let me save this. And I'm doing them deliberately, damn it, into the same order. Oh, I forgot to give this auto increment. Let me quickly fix this. I'll fix this in the online code. That failed. As an aside, the fact that I couldn't insert Leitner and uh, Malin and Tove failed because I didn't specify an ID number, even though it's expecting one, and I forgot to check auto increment, which means they were all by default getting zero, but that then contradicts which property that we've specified. The primary key was violated, so it didn't even let me do it. So let me fix this. Now let me go back to the Insert tab here and specify that I want Leitner, Malin, and one more row, Tove. And now, lastly, the only one that's a little hard to remember is Course Instructor. Let's insert now that Course ID 1 is Instructor ID 1, so that's CS1 and Henry. Course ID 2 is Instructor ID 2, which is CS50 and Malin. And then the last ones we have to worry about is course ID 3, which is CS51, is taught by course uh, instructor 1, which is Henry, and 3 is also taught by 3, which is Tove. So hopefully now we've recreated this. Damn it. Ah, did the same thing. Uh, instru course instructor needs auto increment. All right. I'll do this faster this time. Course 1, course 2, 2. And now lastly, we do CS51, which has course ID 3 and Henry, and course ID 3 and Jesse. That looks good. Whew. OK. So now let's go back to the terminal window. So if I describe courses, we'll see this. If I want to see courses, I can now do select star from courses, semicolon. And now we see those values. And now what else do I want to do? Select star from instructors. That's as I expected. And select star from courses, un, uh, course underscore instructor. So how do I now join these tables? So the beauty of having chosen the ID values in this way is that if you think about taking the course table and the instructor table, and then inserting in between those two in your mind the course instructor table, you can kind of line up all of these ID columns so that you merge them into one massive column that has all of the information we care about. The SQL syntax for this isn't necessarily obvious, but let's see if we can do it. So select 
star from courses, and there's a few ways we can do this. I'm going to hit enter just to kind of format things nicely, but that arrow is just a symptom of the client side tool. It has nothing to do with SQL itself. So select star from courses. I'm going to now join the courses table on the course instructor table, how on the field called courses.id equaling course underscore instructor dot. What's the name of the corresponding field here that I want to couple? It's not ID. It's what? Sorry? Course ID. OK, let me zoom out. But I want to take this one step further. I've now done this table and this one. Now I want to pull this guy in as well. So let me further join this whole thing on the instructors table on what? Course underscore instructor dot instructor ID equaling instructors dot ID. So we could have written this query in a few ways. The order in which I did this isn't all that important. I just kind of did it in my mind from left to right. Um, we could have done this in a few different ways, but if I now have the semicolon and hit enter, notice I get back a new temporary table, a result set, so to speak, in database speak. And what do I have in this thing? I have an ID, a name, another ID, which is kind of confusing to me at the moment, a course ID, an instructor ID, ID, and name. So at the end of the day, we have the right data now. I can see that CS1 is taught by Leitner. CS51 is taught by Leitner and Tove, and CS50 is taught by Malin. But I'm a little nervous about this ambiguity I've created. What's the ambiguity I'm alluding to? Yeah. There's three ID columns. So we can actually fix this. And we're actually going to defer to our framework ultimately to help us with this. But it turns out that there's a keyword in SQL called as, where you can specify an alias, a new name for a field, so that we can avoid this ambiguity altogether. But realize that if we don't address it somehow, as with that keyword or a framework, there's potentially this ambiguity if you try to access the ID field, because clearly there are ones with duplicate names there. So this is a join. And I think in your mind's eye, the best way to think about it really is to take the two tables, line them up in the way that you want. And this is a so-called inner join in the sense that we're com combining the tables here. There are other types of joins that we might encounter over time, like outer joins. But for the most part, this is probably the most common for reconstructing data. What we have done now is generally what's called nor uh, normalizing your data so that there is no duplication anywhere in your tables. And by duplication, I would have meant that first approach. If we had mentioned Leitner and Tove in multiple places in your database, that's not generally the best decision, especially if their name might change over time. Or in the case of marriage, a maiden name might change itself. You just want one canonical place for some data value like a name. All right, so to recap, we've had a few design decisions to make. And the most important ones probably reduce to some of these choices of indexes. But let me point out one other thing as well. If I go back to PHP MyAdmin, one feature you might not have encountered before is the following. If I go to Course Instructor, I already did specify that some of these things have indexes. But let me go to the Structure tab of Course Instructor. Let me click now on Indexes. And notice the following. I have specified here that there is a primary key on the column called ID. This is a somewhat complicated way of specifying it. Cardinality and so forth is referring to the size of the field in bytes. But now I also have another field, course ID, um, which is uh, course ID, which is done in advance, unique. Oh, OK, I did this one in advance for us. So why is this? Let me drop this for the sake of discussion. Oh, you know what I did? OK. So earlier, one of the perils of using a GUI tool like this, when we were creating this join table, the course instructor table, recall that I specified that I want an index on this field and an index on this other field. The side effect of checking both of those boxes on the same screen is that PHP MyAdmin inferred from that that I want not two separate indexes, that I want a joint index, which is generally only helpful or most helpful when you're searching on not one field, but both of those fields. And that's why we had them conjoined there. So I dropped it, because that was not what I intended. Rather, I'm going to redo this here. I'm going to go to the course ID, and under More, I'm just going to say Add Index. And I'm going to go under Instructor ID and say Add Index. And now if we click here, notice we have three indexes, one primary, and as I intended, one for each of those 
foreign keys. And I call it foreign because course ID in this table maps to which field, just to be clear, in another table. The primary key called ID in the table called courses. And same deal for the other one. But now is an interesting trick and really technique. I just went ahead and let me do that a little more slowly. In the same screen, notice it says relation view here. I clicked this. And now notice I get to do a few constraints. So one of the upsides also of not only using conceptually foreign keys in other tables like we've just done, is that by defining an index on them, you can have the database help you even more ensure the integrity of that field. Specifically, <coughs> I can now specify via this dropdown that the course ID field in this table actually maps onto courses.id. Similarly, does instructor underscore ID map to instructors.id? Now, why is this useful? Well, notice on the right hand side what appears now. I can now teach the database that if Henry, for instance, ever retires and his row disappears from the instructors table altogether, thereby being deleted, I can, via this uh, cascading approach, ensure that any courses he teaches are no longer associated with him. I can teach the database to delete the rows in this so called join table automatically if Henry or if one of his courses disappears. Now, why is this compelling? Yeah. You only have to do it once. And longer term, right, it's very easy if, you, if sort of people come and go, courses come and go. Your database could just get littered with courses and with faculty that are no longer relevant to the data set. And your data starts to get very messy and dirty and stale. And so here, we can sort of enforce some of these constraints. Yeah? How does it know that the database It knows by way of this. This is the screen where we are specifying a linkage between foreign key and primary key. So all of the naming conventions I alluded to earlier are just conventions. There's no inherent meaning. This is the screen, which is only useful after you've specified indexes on each of those fields, as we did. And per this dropdown, we have a few things. For instance, if a course is deleted, you can actually prevent that deletion from happening if there is a row in this table by just saying restrict. In other words, Henry cannot retire until we decouple him from CS51 and CS1. So that's a good thing. But it could trigger errors in your code if you don't anticipate that. Or we can have a cascade. Cascade, um, similar to like cascading style sheets and a cascading waterfall, means that if a court, if Henry retires, so is, by getting deleted, so will his row here get deleted. No action means nothing, or null is kind of useful if you kind of want some historical record of Henry having taught CS51, but you just want that field to be null so that the row is there, but it's not any longer associated with him. So these are very powerful techniques that you can and should use, even though um, in the interest particularly of saving you from yourself. So let me make mention of a couple of final details here, ingredients with which um, that might be helpful as we plan for database design. You also have choice over the database engine that you use in your code. Um, if you're familiar, if you took CS161 you might, or even 61, you might generally be familiar with file systems. And there's things like uh, NTFS and HFS plus and X, uh, um, XFS4 and 3 and so forth. There's different ways of storing data on disk. Similarly, are there different ways of storing data in a database? By default, at least in the appliance with the latest version of MySQL, we've been using the database engine called InnoDB which supports a few nice features. But another common one is also called MyISAM. And yet another that can be used is memory, which means don't put anything on disk, just keep things in memory. For the most part, you probably won't go wrong just starting with InnoDB. But for any projects that tend to involve high rates of insertion, for instance, like a lot of rapid logging, hundreds of things per second or thousands of things, anytime you have a lot of stuff going on in a database, then these kinds of lower level decisions start to get involved. The full text uh, feature, for instance, works only in my ISAM. So that has an implication. But you may recall this. Let's at least motivate why we care about InnoDB in particular. A race condition generally refers to what? Right, this is an allusion to an example some of you might have heard in years past, whether in 161 or 50, where you, you have a roommate, both of you really like milk, one of you gets home first, opens the fridge, there's no milk, closes the fridge, you walk across the streets at CVS, get in line to buy some milk. Meanwhile, your roommate comes back, he or she also likes milk, opens the fridge, realizes no milk, he or she then goes to the store, maybe the other CVS, 
Fast forward a few minutes later, you come back, and now both of you have bought milk. One of them's now going to spoil because you don't like milk that much. And this is a problem, right? Because both of you inspected the state of some variable and made a decision based on it, even though the state of that variable was essentially in the process of being changed, albeit slowly over the amount of time it takes to get to and from CVS. So, what is a sort of stupid real world solution to that problem? Leave a note, right? Oh, <laughs> this happened last time. Always leave a note. Um, or padlock the thing literally. And I say padlock because if you do take or took CS161, locking is a fundamental idea in that kind of world. So race conditions can arise also in the database world. And you might recall, maybe from CS50 Finance, if you took 50, this code that we actually gave you guys in the specification at the time so that your operation is so called atomic. If you wanted to, in this case, buy a share of stock and that stock has some particular symbol, we told you to use code like this. Because by way of this on duplicate key update syntax, which is built into MySQL, you're effectively doing either an insert or an update after doing a select to see if a stock is already in there. In other words, the analog in the world of buying a stock to the, the milk in the refrigerator might be, first, before buying a share of Google, you might want to select from the database all of the shares of Google that David owns to see if he owns zero or more. Once you see if he owns zero or more, you have to then do the following. You either have to do an insert if he owns zero, because there's no row for David yet, or you have to do an update if, at least in theory, you want to have one row per user. The problem is selecting that number of shares and then updating or inserting could be interrupted by someone else at another computer terminal trying to buy or sell some of David's shares of stocks, whether, uh, in, whether for good purposes or sort of malicious purposes. It's like going to the store when your roommate gets back and checks the state of the variable. So this syntax at the time, which was sort of appropriate for CS50, avoids that problem altogether. And it just does all of that magic of locking for you. But now, with these kinds of projects for this course, which most likely will involve more complex data sets, you can't achieve always this atomicity, this everything happens at once or not at all, without interruption, so elegantly. And so MySQL and other database engines support things called locks, whereby you can say, lock this table so that only one thread, and generally only one user, can touch it at any point in time to read or write and then you can unlock it. This is an example from one of MySQL's own references where if you have like a bank account that you're trying to deduct money from and then add money to, you might want to make sure that both of those things happen together so that there's no mathematical errors and no one loses money somehow. The problem with locks, though, in a database is that it generally means the whole table is locked, which means if you have 100 people trying to do business with your bank online at the same amount of time, only one of them can go at a time, which is stupid, especially on servers nowadays that have eight cores, 16 cores, have a huge amount of memory. There's no reason to serialize all of your transactions if those customers are only going to interact with their own rows. So InnoDB allows you to do things more intelligently, and this generally will be the approach you take in code, is you use something called a transaction. And you do this generally in PHP code, Ruby code, Python, whatever, but the SQL code that's ultimately used is this, typically, start transaction, then you specify one, uh, two or more queries that you want to execute all together without interruption or not at all. There can even be some select statements in here or some deletes or updates. But the nice thing is that the database will be smart enough to make sure that it will only lock the rows that are actually involved in these updates or selects or deletes. So if you've got thousands of rows and you're only touching three of them, only that subset of the table will be locked, which means those other 99 customers can touch their rows without being serialized and slowed down by you. Meanwhile, this is the nicest aspect, too, of transactions. They are transactions in the sense, like 161 on a file system, they're transactional, which means you can roll them back. You can undo them. This is like the command or control F of databases. If you discover partway through all of your various data operations, shoot, something's gone wrong, you literally execute a different SQL query rollback, and all of, this all of the statements you executed after saying start transaction disappear as though they never happen, which is an amazingly powerful thing. And these are the kinds of things, certainly in 50, we sort of sweep under the rug, and you just kind of assume that all will be well. But once you start thinking about real projects and real users and the integrity of your database, these are the kinds of design decisions that are going to be important.